virtual visit to Ananda in, in, or Ananda in Texas. So it's all yours. <laughs> Thank you so much for having me. It's so nice to see many of you. I actually was looking through the names. I don't actually know too many of you very personally. I know Hugh. Hugh and I got to spend the summer together up at the uh, meditation retreat for Living Discipleship and Sam yes. um, and a few others. But it's just really beautiful. It's a blessing to be here with all of you. And I feel like for the past few weeks, I've been just tuning into all of you energetically and um feeling your energy and sending many prayers your way for all of the weather and uh, that you have had to storm uh, all the storms you've had to weather I guess is a way to say it that would be a, a play on words but you guys have been in my heart and in my thoughts and I'm very grateful to be here with all of you today um, and to talk about this topic um, you know when I was speaking with my tree she said you can talk about anything that you would like to talk about or the Sunday reading and this reading happens to be one of my favorites by thinking, can we arrive at understanding because it's all about opening the heart and devotion. And um, so I thought it was a beautiful place to just spend a little bit of time sharing some thoughts that I have on it. And then, as Maitri said, we'll open it up and I would love to get to know all of you a bit more. And I was thinking, you know, the um, the chanting, both the song, Sam, that you uh, shared and the chant engrossed as the bee of my mind that Mark and Maitri shared. The power of music that comes through all of you and uh, the vibration and the energy that you share through your music is so powerful. And I was thinking we could, I could just ask you guys to keep chanting for the next 30 minutes. And we really could touch into the essence of what this Sunday's reading is all about because it's the answer by thinking, can I arrive? Can we arrive at understanding? No, but by experiencing, we arrive at understanding and I could feel the devotion flowing through the music. I could just sit here for another three hours and chant with all of you. So you might see me dropping into your kirtans soon because I felt such power and energy flowing through all of you. And um, you know, that is, that's the beauty of what we've been given on this path. You know, uh, Paramahansa Yogananda tells us that this is a path not uh, that is not ruled by dogma, by tradition, by ritual. We have traditions and rules and rituals that we can follow because those habit patterns that we um, embed into our consciousness that uh, give us those opportunities time and time again. I was thinking about the fire ceremony that many of us have when we're live and in person, we get to come to every single week in the purific purification ceremony or the festival of light. We have these traditions that are built into worship here at Ananda that holds a very powerful um, connection to the divine. But in essence, those traditions that we have, the rules that we follow, um, and all of the experiences that we've been given through the teachings of Paramahansa Yogananda and, and through the inspiration of Swami Kriyananda, their only their power lies in the amount of energy and willingness that we individually bring into that act of worship. So the chanting that we were hearing this morning, the power came from not only Maitri and Mark who were on the mic singing, but through the power that every single one of us was coming together and offering into that. And it's, you know, the vibration that we would feel in the ritual, in the chant, in whatever it may be, there's always benefit. It's always better to sit down and chant than to not. But the true, you know, every act of devotion and every act of worship that we offer, it's impregnated with divine consciousness only to the extent that we bring that divine consciousness to it, which is such a powerful gift because we hold the keys to our own awakening. And that's what Paramahansa Yogananda tells us over and over again. Don't take my word for it. Be a scientist, experiment, sit at the meditation pillow, work through your kriyas, work through your meditation and feel the transformation that happens. And that's in essence what Christ is saying in this reading. It doesn't matter what goes into a man's mouth, but what comes out of it. What matters is the amount of um, love and devotion that we are offering into each and every act that we do in our lives because in essence, everything is love. So in order to truly understand, which is what the question this week is asking by thinking, can we come to understanding? No, because what we're trying to understand is love, is that pure vibration of divine consciousness. And in essence, con uh, divine consciousness is Satchitananda. 
ever-present, ever-existing, ever-new bliss. It is the purest expression of love. And the only way to tap into and to understand that love is to attune ourselves to it, which is what we're doing in each little action. I was reminded of um, one of uh, Mother Teresa's famous quotes, do small things with great love. It doesn't matter the greatness or the grandness of the gesture that we are offering uh, to the divine. What matters is the amount of love that we carry and the devotion that we carry into it, which reminded me, I want to tell a story from the Ramayana, which many of you may know, but it's one of my favorites. So hopefully you'll enjoy it um, no matter what. And it's the story of Lord Rama and the squirrel. And Lord Rama is planning uh, to, he's fighting the war. And he asks his army of monkeys to build a bridge across the sea. And so these big, strong soldier, uh, monkey soldiers, they start picking up boulders and stones and carrying huge um, boulders and stones and other materials down to the sea from the mountains. And they begin to build this bridge and they're strong and they're powerful and they're doing work for Lord Rama. So they're doing good work in the world. And then there's this little tiny squirrel who's running in between the monkeys as they're carrying these big boulders. And he has little tiny pebbles and stones in his mouth and he's running from the mountains and from the forests and dropping the stones one by one into this grand bridge that is being built across the sea. And one day the squirrel is running through all of the feet of the monkeys as they're carrying their boulders. And one of the monkey soldiers almost steps on the squirrel and he jumps back and he scolds the little squirrel. And he says, watch where you're going. We are doing Lord Rama's work. We're carrying boulders and building a bridge. Stay out of the way. And the little squirrel looks up at him and he says, oh, I'm sorry, but you have to watch where you're going. I'm building a bridge for Lord Rama. I'm carrying stones to the sea. I'm doing a great work. And to shorten the story a bit, the monkey scoffs at the, the little squirrel and says, what can you really offer? Here you are, this little tiny squirrel with these pebbles. Look at what we're carrying. Look at the work we're doing. You could never build this bridge for Lord Rama. And all of the others, he rallies all of the other soldiers around him and they're all laughing and mocking and making fun of the squirrel. And the squirrel and his love and devotion for Lord Rama, he cries out to Lord Rama and he appears and there the Lord appears and Lord Rama picks him up in his hands and he strokes his back with such love and devotion. And he says to uh, all of the other monkey soldiers who are around him and he said, he says, don't, how dare you scoff at this uh, sweet little squirrel? How dare you scoff at the squirrel who's doing my work? And he says, who do you think it is? All of the, that is filling in all of the gaps, each of these stones and pebbles and grains of sand, they're filling in all of the little gaps that are left by your large stones and boulders. This squirrel is doing our work and he's doing our, my work for me with love and with devotion. And that's when he, I told the story too soon, that's when he picks up the squirrel and and he just nuzzles him against his cheek and strokes his back. And this is why it's a beautiful story. Squirrels in India actually have three white stripes on their back. And this is where that story comes from, that those three stripes of Lord Rama are what created that, um, that pattern that we now see on squirrels in India today. And it was the impression of Lord Rama's love born from the devotion that the squirrel felt and just the power of that metaphor that this little squirrel's devotion, his heart's love and devotion is what filled in all of the little gaps. And it made me think about the way that each one of us works in the world and we have grand gestures and small gestures that we have to accomplish on a day-to-day -day basis, not only in our spiritual life and attuning more and more to our uh, guru and to the great masters, but also in our professional lives and our familial lives. And the more that we can fill in those gaps by tuning into love through an act of devotion and an act of service in whatever form that comes to us, we're growing and we're expanding and we're understanding more about the essence of what it truly means to live in love, which is, of course, how we come to understanding. The mind can't get there on its own. It reminded me of the verb, you know, the English language is, is so incredible and there are a lot of different words and adjectives that we can use, but I was tuning into the verbs conocer and saber, for those of you that know Spanish. There are two different verbs that mean to know in Spanish. 
And saber is used when we're talking about facts and statistics. Oh, I know this, I know how to get there. I know the answer to that question. And conocer is used when we're talking about knowing someone, knowing something that's a little bit more intimate in that sense. It's a little more resonant with the idea of really understanding. And that's the essence of where we're headed. We can know love, we can see love in the world, we can have examples of it, but to truly experience it, it's not just about what we receive, but more so it's about what we can give and what we offer into the world in every single act that we're doing. It's another story that I wanted to share with this um, comes from uh, my own experience and some of the seva that I do here in Ananda Palo Alto. This was about five or six years ago now. And one of my save a job uh, opportunities on Sundays when it's warmer, we have our fire ceremony outside. And it's really wonderful because we have a big fire pit and everybody gets to bring rice and everyone gets to offer their rice into uh, the fire. So it's interactive in that sense. And there's usually about 25 or 30 people there. And then my seva uh, task at the end of that fire ceremony, everyone would go into the temple to meditate and perform the purification. And I would stay outside and clean everything up. And um, on one particular day, it was uh, just a little bit, I don't know, I, I want to say it was hot and uncomfortable. It probably wasn't. I was probably just in a mood <laughs> that day. And I was um, outside cleaning up the fire ceremony. And one of the things that we do is we clean up the rice. So we sweep up the rice um, as much as we can just to prevent the birds from eating it and getting sick. And um, I was outside sweeping up all of the rice and I could feel in me this irritation that I wanted to be inside meditating. I wanted to be inside performing, you know, participating in the purification ceremony. Again, here coming back to the rituals, the, um, uh, the traditions that we've been given. So for me, it felt I, I just had this irked feeling that I wanted to be closer to God and I wanted to be inside and quiet and meditating and I wanted to go up and offer uh, my offer myself in purification. And I was frustrated that I had to be outside cleaning up. And so I was sweeping up all of the rice, just feeling that irksomeness. And by the grace of God, the thought came through my mind. And I just thought, Lakshmi, you are cleaning up the rice that all of your guru by have just offered. They've spiritualized by offering it up their astral spine and into the fire of purification. And you have the great opportunity to sweep up all those stray seeds of karma that didn't actually make it into the fire and to offer them. I mean, I'm just offering them. We're just throwing them away. The task itself on the outer level didn't change but it shifted everything for me. I was so focused on what I was doing and playing a game with God and saying, let's make sure we get every last grain of rice. And I was so involved in the process and thinking about my guru bias and tuning into all of the karma and everything that they had offered up in spirit and spiritualized to the divine. And it completely not only transformed the task, but all that I had been craving, that desire for inner communion, that desire to be closer to the divine, to know love, to be uh, in attunement with that love that I wanted to get by sitting inside and going up and burning my piece of paper in purification, I got so much more than I could have ever imagined from that one ritual, which of course is what Christ is talking about in the midst of this reading. It's not what goes into a man's mouth that uh, makes him impure, but what comes out of it. So again, he's saying it's not the ritual of how we wash our hands before we eat. That's not what matters. What matters is the devotion that we're bringing in our hearts. In essence, it's we visit this parable later in the year, but it's the parable of Martha and Mary and the two sisters who are serving Christ and Mary's laying at Christ's feet in devotion and washing his feet and adorning them in oils. And Martha's in the kitchen and she's feeding all of the disciples and cleaning up after them and taking care of all of the things that need to be taken care of. And she complains to Christ and she says to him, you're just allowing my sister to lay at your feet. And his response, his teaching to her is that it's the inward devotion that is important to me. It's not the outer act. And that's what each one of us has an opportunity to look at and to do. It's those small 
um, opportunities to tune in. It's not the grand gestures. So me being outside, sweeping up the fire ceremony, cleaning up, making sure that everything is presentable so that when service ends and everybody walks out onto our piazza here in Palo Alto, it was cleaned and it was ready. And we had we have a bagel bar and a farmer's market and everything was set up, which was my task. It wasn't the outward gestures. I, it can look that way and I can say, oh, look at what a good karma yogi or great sevaka I am. Look at all the work that I can do. But it was a hollow act until I was able to tune in to the essence of that love that we are seeking, which is why when we heard this um, when Mark was reading the affirmation again today, a line that stood out. It was so beautiful. I, this is just paraphrased, but with devotion, we commit to commune with the only reality there truly is. Through the act of devotion, we commit to communing with the only reality there truly is, because there is only one reality. And that only reality that exists is love. It's divine love. And the only way that we can get there is by, as Sri Yukteswar says, opening up the natural love of the heart, which is why he tells us we can't take one step on the spiritual path without developing the natural love of the heart, because to know God, to know love, we have to experience it. And experiencing it doesn't just mean receiving, it means giving it in every single moment. It means giving it in all of the small gestures, carrying a pebble to the oceans and dropping it into the grand bridge that's being built for Lord Rama, filling in each of those little gaps. Just as I said earlier with um, uh, Mother Teresa's quote, do small things with great love. This is how we transform. Master tells us the minutes are more important than the years. It's again this concept that it's not the grand gesture. It's what we're doing step by step in every single moment that's bringing us closer to the divine. And that's ultimately bringing us to that place of understanding. Because it's not, we don't want to just know, as in Saber, we don't want to just know love and point it out and give you the definition of it. We don't want to just know how to enter into the fire ceremony and go up and bow before the masters and light our piece of paper on fire. We want to stand up in front of the masters in any ceremony, in any act of worship, and give our whole being into that fire of transformation. Because again, that's the way, that's the moment that the divine will enter in and take charge of our lives when we open our hearts, which is why we say, open your heart to me and I will enter and take charge of your life. Every single activity that we do can be impregnated with that transformative power of the divine if we're willing to listen and to offer ourselves into it. That's why I thought I'm so inspired by the music that I just kept thinking, I'm just going to pull lyrics and quote lyrics over and over again. But that beautiful rendition of um, God's call within, where he's saying, in silence of love, in silence of song, in cave of love, find my abode. The more that we can draw that energy in, it doesn't matter what the outer activity is. It doesn't matter if we're waking up every day and going to work um, out in the world or raising our family, or if we're um, you know, leading a kirtan or a Sunday worship service, whatever the act is, it can be impregnated with divine consciousness if we're willing to tune in and we're willing to offer that up. We get to be the little squirrel and then we live the rest of our lives with the imprint of Lord Rama, with the imprint of God's love on us and we wear it on our hearts. And that, that has an impression on the world that changes and transforms everything around it, which is the power of self-realization. Self-realization is not passive. It's not accepting with even-mindedness and cheerfulness, all that comes our way. It's actually being in, in, uh, someone who can impact and change the world with love because God's love can flow through us, can be a channel. It's everything that we've just been experiencing today. I've been so touched to be with all of you today and just feel the energy and the power flowing through the healing prayers, flowing through the affirmation that uh, we were sharing for uh, Nanda Texas overall. It's just all of this power and faith and devotion that's flowing through all of what you do, it has an impact on the world. And I can feel it. And I feel so uplifted and inspired just being here with all of you today. Um, so I'm very, very grateful. I think that might be a nice place to end and just get to talk with all of you a little more. Thank you so much for sharing your 
I suppose it's your afternoon now <laughs> with me. Well, thank you, Lakshmi. It's such a blessing to have you. And um, I, I wanted to, I didn't give you much of an introduction. So I think one of the first things I would like to ask, and, and, and everybody is welcome to ask questions as we typically do. You can either open up your mics or uh, raise your hand or put it in the chat box and we'll for sure address it. But I was wondering if you could just tell us a little bit more. I, I know you're a really busy person. Um, a little bit more about what you do uh, at Ananda Palo Alto and and maybe even, you know, a little bit of how you came on this path because I think uh, as we're getting to know each other, that, that that's a real helpful information and, and we would love to hear about that. Wonderful, yeah. Um, so currently here in Palo Alto, um, I serve as one of the co-managers of the Sangha. So there are three of us that are the co-managers here. And I work um, full-time here at the Sangha, but then I also work part-time as a high school English teacher for a public school in the area. So in the mornings I'm on, right now we're digital, but in the mornings I'm with my students online and then um, in the afternoons and into the evenings I get to be here. Um, just serving in various roles, and but mostly just as the man as one of the co-managers. So, holding uh, all of the branches of the ministries that we have here. So, I oversee the family ministry, the healing prayer ministry, the sevaka ministry, and a few others, along as well as um, uh, along with all of my my other two co-managers that I have. So it's wonderful, and that's a fairly new development. It happened in March of last year. So it's been a year that I've been officially working as a Sangha team member here. Prior to that, I was full-time at the high school, but spending all of my evenings and afternoons um, here in Palo Alto. And I've been in Palo Alto since 2012, so almost 10 years now. And um, my journey onto the path was, it was interesting. So my senior year of college, which was in 2009, I took a course called Compassion. And the professor in this course, she introduced us, the whole essence of the course was to read different exemplars um, who were spiritually in inclined or who used contemplative practices and expansive practices in their own lives. And um, so we would read and study them and then we would model and practice some of their practices. So for example, we read Viktor Frankl's Man's Search for Meaning and then we spent two weeks doing um, a forgiveness uh, contemplative practice and we took different people in our lives and we practiced forgiveness and sometimes you would actually have to write a letter of forgiveness. Other times it was simply meditative. Um, and then we wrote about our experiences with that. And um, so that introduced me to the concept of an inner life um, and an inner religion. I didn't really know much about it before that. And from there, I studied a number of different, I, I should say, I explored a number of different traditions. I looked, at, I went to uh, several Buddhist meditations and the professor that I was working with was involved with the Sufi tradition. And so I spent a little time with her. Um, but nothing was really resonating. And then when I moved up here for the job that I was at at the high school, I always would pass the Sangha, the temple, on the way to uh, work every day. And it said the center of self-realization. And I thought, I wonder what that is. And one day I walked in, I knew nothing. I didn't know any Yogananda. I'd never heard of autobiography of a yogi. I just walked in and sat in the back and I thought, this is it, this is home. And from there, that was about almost 10 years ago now. So from there, it's just been progressively learning more and more. But, so. Beautiful. So it, it, how about anybody else? Anybody have some questions or comments about uh, Lakshmi's talk? Anybody want to join in? I just in? want to say hello. Hi, Lakshmi. And uh, welcome, Lakshmi, to Ananda in Dallas uh, or Texas. Uh, it's such a blessing to see you again and having spent that month in the Living Discipleship Program. I, that's right, I got to know Lakshmi. Uh, and I, I tuned into her because she was, at that time, she was a full time teacher. And so we had a lot of experiences on having to work oh, yeah. in, in a worldly profession. And then at the same time, the challenge of being uh, able to do my mother's work. Uh, but I just wanted to say thank you for the wonderful uh, stories and inspiration. and and it's an, I, I know, I don't know about other people, but I need that reminder often because, you know, we ha having taken so many workshops in Ananda, you know, every, going back years in, in our teaching center in Panava, and then Jit Tender came in 
did the devotion workshop and then doing uh, I went with Metri to the education for life and that would be a grand gesture for me I mean I had in my heart I would love to work at an Ananda school education for life right working as a teacher now but then you get into that irksome like Lakshmi said you know a little bit of irritability we you start thinking oh my gosh if only I was over there doing master's work at an actual Ananda school it wouldn't be like this or you know, it's it's so easy to get into that uh, word pulling energy where you don't see the influence that you're having now in the particular area that you're in by drawing into Divine Mother's teachings and Master's teachings and sharing that light and love with all the people that you currently have and you're trusted with because after all, it's Divine Mother that put them before you. And so I just want to say thank you for that reminder. It's always a blessing uh when i have that and especially from somebody that i know yeah yeah it's true it's powerful sometimes we think that we have to be one of the soldiers carrying the big boulders doing that that we're in tune but you know it's not as exactly as you're saying it's our heart's devotion and sometimes the work happens in those smaller areas yeah, it's wonderful to see you too when i saw your name on the screen i got so happy <laughs> Well, I'd like to say, number one, Lakshmi, thank you. This is Supriya. And your enthusiasm is very infectious in a beautiful way. So thank you for that. And just to tie in from your story and what you said and what my mind is thinking and probably many of us are thinking, you know, we always have, no, we don't always. I'm going to erase that part and say, it sometimes occurs that we have the thought that we wish something was other than it is. And that's one of the basic yamas or, or niyamas. I can't remember which one right now, so I won't try to put it under the category. But to realize wherever we are, there we are with God and Guru. And it's just as powerful in the sweeping of the rice or in the being isolated in a home. But it's just as, if we can just remember this, and I'm still working on it, obviously, but to not wish that circumstances were different, you know, but when we can say, change not the circumstance, Lord, but change me, to be in that moment with God and gurus, then it's all so wonderful when it does happen. And the greatness, I'll close with this, is when we are aware, then that's not happening. That is such a blessing. And I think that's our meditation practice really helps that, to be aware when we are not in that moment of divine connection. Because it doesn't feel good. And we learn more and more. Aha, even in this, help me, we can say help me, but then be in joy with God. And we're all still practicing. And the blessings of this Sangha is just amazing. I, I don't know how I would be getting through this COVID, being isolated by myself without this Sangha online. So, and thanks for visiting. You know, what you're saying is so powerful. Um, <clears throat> Um, I just lost the thought. <laughs> I was so struck by all of what you were saying, but you know, this uh, being contented where we are and being able to listen in for those small moments, you know, God comes to us in whispers. We think about the thunder of Om and the, and you know, this, the grand, the grandio grandiosity, I don't know if that's a word, but the grandness of God. But when God actually speaks to us, it's in those moments of silence and those whispers. And so when we can tune in, and to just practice here I am, right here, I'm listening, I'm open and open ourselves up to that. Then yeah, I think exactly what you're saying Supriya is beautiful and it's perfect. That's when we get the guidance that we need to take the next step and we listen in for what our tests are. I tell myself all the time, ah, that's what I wanted to comment on. Your comment about awareness. 
I tell them, uh, you know, I speak to master all of the time and I say, thank you for the awareness, just like you're saying, because you're right. Sometimes the anger comes in and the reactions there, or, you know, we get whatever the emotion is, it just comes and we can't stop it, but we can reflect back. And I can say, I remember, and I'm aware this is not the person I want to be. And this is not the way I need to act. And it's such a blessing to, to even know that much to know, to say, thank you for the awareness. Thank you, Lakshmi. I, 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 before we get too much further down the road, I, I wanted to do a quick shout out to Sam and thank him for a, a beautiful rendition of Life is a Dream. Mm -hmm. um, even with a little bit of hiccups here and there on, on the internet, it was, it was beautiful and very heartfelt. Uh, but I did have a question. You know, it brings up the, the, the subject of, yeah, it's, we want to be able to feel that heart's devotion in whatever we're doing, but we're human and we're, <laughs> and we're trying to get there, you know, we're working on it. But I wondered, um, you know, if you have something, a favorite practice that you, you kind of your go-to thing that you do to reawaken that, uh, that devotion again, if you're, if you're feeling a little um, less than devotional, let's just say. Yeah, I think for me, um... Uh, music is probably the number one way that I would tune back in. I've really found lately, you know, this is a, a story that one of my mentors was telling me, her sister, this was many, many years ago, but her sister passed and she was helping her sister through the process of dying. She was um, passing of cancer. And she realized that uh, in the weeks after her sister passed that she was listening to the oratorio almost nonstop. It was just constantly on everywhere that she was. And about 20 years later, she was reflecting on that experience and she realized it was because tuning into the oratorio or any of Swami, Swami Kriyananda's music, it lifted her into a state of consciousness where she could tune into wherever her sister was after she had passed it, brought it, it just the vibration, the essence of it inherently lifted her consciousness while the emotion could stay where it needed to stay on the human level because the grief and the sadness didn't go away, but there was a vibratory shift. And I have found that within myself, you know, I'll often um, just go for a, like go out and go for a run if I'm feeling agitated and irritated and I'll turn on Swami's music or I'll turn on chanting and allow that vibration to soothe and to shift my, my consciousness and my energy. And, um, you know, I, again, I can feel that even in the chat that, you, that the two of you were sharing earlier and in the song Sam was sharing, um, I can feel the ways that I'm sure all of you are tuning into the music as well. But I think for me, opening my heart, you know, Swami Kriyananda said, if you want to know me, listen to my music and singing his music is a whole nother experience. I, I don't fancy myself to be a, a wonderful singer, but I'm learning and I'm working on it and I'm trying to improve my voice because I think singing the music shifts our consciousness. It refines it even more than simply listening to it. So that's what I do. What about others? What do well, well, I think it's, um, you know, I, I think part of it that we as devotees are um, explore in our spiritual journey is what are those individual ways that um, we that God that we are open to feel God's presence and it is that's the beauty of that divine romance is that it is so unique and an individual and as we we try to cultivate that you know and if we don't know what that is yet then we keep calling we keep calling you know I want to know I want to feel I know you're here with me in every moment but I'm not feeling it right now so please speak to me and I know um, I don't know I've been sort of a, a bit of a you know you go through these things during this pandemic life in general but it seems like it's exaggerated for me at least in this last year and I've been in a bit of what I would call the doldrums recently and uh, and I'm like you it's the music that it really makes a difference when you when you re you reminded me of uh, when you're talking about the oratorio when my father had had a stroke and was just really battling and I was spending nights in the hospital and it was very hard on me. I remember putting on the oratorio 
and listening to it all night long and I'd go you know I might fall asleep but it was still going you know and it was just like it was like a lifeline for me and that is the the way that Master works with me and Divine Mother works with me that's the particular way and so uh, last night for instance well it happened it happened actually during the kirtan Supriya was playing um, uh, what's it what was the chant the um, night has flown dawn has oh, come yeah. yeah and and it reminded me that I had and I loved it thank you Sophia. Um but it also reminded me of this real powerful version that I'd heard uh, just you know how you're going across the internet it was actually a kirtan by SRF convocation last summer and I, it reminded me of that and so I decided for some reason I got this whisper <laughs> I mean it, you know not it's like, I want to look that up again. And so I looked it up and we ended up listening to this whole kirtan last night, you know, and it was so powerful. It got me to sit and meditate because it's three hours long. This whole thing was three hours long. And I was thinking that was master. You know, that was master saying, you know, I know you're in the doldrums and I'm having a real hard time reaching you right now. But remember that it, it, it just, it's so, I just want to encourage everyone, you know, keep listening and tuning in in those small ways and go for it. I mean, I always think of it as guerrilla warfare. You just got to keep, you know, going at it. it. There's just, it's not always easy. <laughs> it often is not easy. So uh, we want to make sure everyone feels welcome to open their mics or their cameras and, and ask a question or make a comment, whatever you feel like you'd like to add to the conversation. Of course, uh, we're not on Facebook right now, so you don't have to worry about uh, going out to the whole rest of the world. And um, of course, you can always uh, put your question in, in the uh, uh, chat window and we'll, and we'll just uh, read the, the question or the comment um, here on the air. I'm Mallory and so I'll uh, share something. Oh, go ahead, Mallory. No, Mallory, go ahead. Go ahead. <laughs> no, no, please. I already talked. I, since nobody else was talking, I was going to share something else. But please go ahead and then I'll go. I was just saying um, when we sang the uh, the hymn hymns, <laughs> what Sam played and the um, different songs. I picture us all in the sanctuary, or I've got these church words today, in the <laughs> temple. Um, I picture us together in the temple, so it makes me feel more a part of the community, singing those songs, because we did sing them in the temple, and, and I love that, and it connects me. And I think about how different people acted during the singing in the temple, <laughs> and so it connects me to um, to others. and. Um, the other thing I want to say is, um, well, something more personal is when I was meditating, I kept, I got distracted, then I reach out again to, to master and Christ and I get distracted, reach out again. And finally, I felt that presence come in and that is such a, that is such, it's everything, you know, when that it's not just me there meditating, it's um, the presence. And then the other thing is I wanted to ask you about the picture of Christ because it's, I love that picture of Christ. I wonder where that comes from. This one behind me? Yeah. I can, I don't remember the author's name, but um, I can find out. This is a, a version that Asha, I can get closer if you guys want to see it. This is a version that Asha had found um, and she loved it. She feels like it really expressed uh, Christ's power um, more than uh, some of the other images that we have of him. And so I can certainly find the author's, I, or the, um, I'm calling him an author, uh, the painter's name and share it with you guys. I'll share it along with my tree because I can't remember now. But yeah, it's beautiful. Some yeah. people find it a little bit intense at first, but if you really sit with it and, and tune into it, you can feel the power of, um, of Christ that's flowing through. So, you think about that. so yeah, I mean, it's on I can share, I can share um, 
a little bit about that picture because Asha mentioned in one of her talks. It um, seems to be a, not seems to be, but it's a drawing that somebody created. I know the person from the Shroud of Turin, which uh, Swamiji really, really loved. And I don't know the whole story behind it, but that's where it comes from. It, it's a representation from the Shroud of Turin that somebody made at some point. And so, the, you know, that's, that's going back a long time. And, and Swamiji just loved that and really resonated with it. But um, maybe we can get more information on that. Um, what I wanted to share with my guru is, a, is just a couple of suggestions or tips or, and what I do when we're not feeling that energy or um, it's a matter of vibration. So say in the morning or if you don't, if you have very little time, I, I wake up in the morning, I put on and on the radio and just to make sure that I start my day with the right vibration. Sometimes I'm, I'm going over there to work with just less energy than I had due to sleep deprivation. I work really late and I just make sure that I um, get into the right, right vibration. If you haven't listened to Radio Nanda, it's, it's just an incredible resource. So many different songs, Swamiji singing in so many different stages of his life when he was young, when he was older and Italian and oh my gosh. I mean, it, it's, it's also like a treat, but it's an instant vibration uplift. And, but if you are, have a little bit more time and you're feeling like you want to open your heart center, I recommend um, Melody Hansen, just go into Ananda School of Yoga Meditation YouTube channel and look up, um, Med Melody Hansen has this beautiful, incredible uh, routine called uh, Yoga to Awaken the Heart or opening, Heart Opening Yoga Routine. Try that Heart Opening Yoga Routine that she shared in last summer's um, uh, so, um, was a spiritual renewal week. I forget which one's in the summer. I think the spiritual renewal week. And it's just powerful. Oh my gosh. I try and do that like once or twice a week and where it's short, it's 36 minutes, but there are all these asanas that, that are, um, and affirmations that are meant to open the heart. And so you can't, but just finish that yoga routine and, and, and be with a close heart. I mean, I, I'm, I just would love for you to try it. Anybody, um, if you haven't already, and it's it's just an incredibly powerful yoga routine to open the heart. I think what both you were sharing and, and Mallory, what you got, what you were sharing about music and the, this thread of music that we've picked up and we've been um, flowing through our conversation. I was just teaching a class last week with Sai Ganesh, who I know was with you guys a few months ago. And um, we were talking about the chakras and, um, and, and then we were also talking, it was an inspire your meditation class. So everything was geared toward meditation. And we were repeating <clears throat> Yogananda's quote, chanting is half the battle. And because we were talking about the chakras, we were talking about how really the heart, which is what, what resonates when we're singing and when we're chanting, it's about halfway up the journey. And so there it is when we're resonating with this journey that we're taking with every meditation breath, with every Kriya breath, as we're drawing energy up through the heart and offering at, at the point between the eyebrows that chanting just brings us right here. It's halfway, it's already gone through the fire of transformation transformation at the third chakra and it's just offered through the heart it's such a beautiful expression and so everything we're saying about music just tunes us in right there to the essence of that experience it's beyond words beyond logic we, you know half the time if you say why do you love a song the, the answer is I don't know I just love it which is so beautiful because we're not using the mind we're hearing it with our heart which is what master and Yogananda is asking us to do we do have a um, question in the chat box. It comes from Alex, our friend in, up in Minnesota, who joins us often. And he says, uh, first of all, it's a comment, wonderful service, love tuning in and hearing new people and wishing you all a wonderful day. It is difficult now that the weather is warming up. He's way up there in cold, cold Minnesota. It's more and more difficult to sit for longer times. How can we remain calm and content when the weather is drawing you up and out of doors, when the darkest hours of the year have given away to the vast amounts of interior work? How do we stay centered in the self amongst the fluctuations of the natural world? And just for context, um, uh, Alex is a farmer. And so he's been having his, his downtime through the winter, you know, and now, and now that up. things are starting to warm up again, then it's going to be, he's going to be getting busy again real soon. I 
certainly have some comments, but I also would love, I mean, if there, if anyone else wanted to start a little more of a satsang feel, if anyone had other things to say first, I don't always have to go first. <laughs> I, I, I like to throw in my, my two bits on this. Um, being a meditation teacher and learning and, how, and teaching uh, uh, walking meditations. When the weather is nice, when it's beautiful outside and you've been trapped inside for a long time, that walking meditation is a, is a wonderful, wonderful tool to keep you going, to, to help center yourself again. The uh, practice that, that I have used in the past is I pick a chant, uh, be it uh, uh, Oh God Beautiful, it's got a nice rhythm to it, and that's the pace that you walk at, or pick a, another chant that's maybe a little slower, or maybe even one that's faster, and keep that chant going in your mind, or Gosh, if you're if you're like me and you don't care what other people think, you sing it out loud <laughs> and you walk and uh, let let uh, Master and God uh, lead you on a walk. And you know how to get how to get out of your doldrum, especially after being locked up and confined for such a long time as we have been. Getting out in chanting and walking and moving at the same time i gosh i can't think of anything better right now i'd like to that kind of brought something up in me like when we're inside uh it's kind of easy maybe to center in ourselves because we're not distracted by what's around us but when we get outside in nature it's i think of it as an expansion of that inner consciousness nature is such a beautiful reminder of the true nature of of the divine all the diversity and all the beautiful colors and sounds and things like that but all that energy we've been putting inside and but you can still keep your eyes closed and be outside and be aware of what your where your physical body is but you're expanded you just take your consciousness out and just throw it out into the wind and uh, i find it even more even more wonderful to be outside and meditate than inside maybe it's a little more challenging for some maybe it depends on the mood of the day <laughs> how i'm how i'm doing but anyway there's a lot of different ways to look at that <clears throat> yeah i'd like to add just a, a personal experience of my own i work for a telecom company that's that's unionized and every now and then people go on strike and uh, and those of us who are considered management have to go out and and fill in for the uh, for the workers in the field and so I was in Massachusetts uh, a few years ago and um, driving a truck and climbing telephone poles and fixing people's telephone uh, wires you know the copper wires believe it or not and uh, anyway we were covering all of Western Massachusetts. And so sometimes my day began, um, yeah, and we were working long days. We were working 12, 14, sometimes 16 hours a day. And uh, some days my the day would begin with driving for an hour and a half to get into the area that I needed to be in to, to start my work. And so what I found really useful during that time, even while I'm you know, driving down the the you know the the turnpike in in Massachusetts was I, I would chant the Gayatri mantra because it was something that I could hold on to even while I was having to be aware of everything around me as I'm driving my truck down the road. So um, that was just uh, one thing that worked for me. I think that everyone, well, I'll, I'll add one more thought that I have, and it's in in the same vein of what all of you are sharing. You know, in essence, we are energetic beings. We know this to be true. And with meditation, what we're doing is we're working with that subtle flow of energy. And so that can mean, you know, as I was listening to your question, Alex, there were two thoughts, two immediate thoughts that came to mind. And the first one was how do we sit when when we really do want to be sitting in front of our altar going deep in meditation, yet the world is drawing us out for one reason or another. 
And my first thought was come back to the techniques. And it, it, no matter where you are on your path toward Kriya Yoga, if you're a Kriya Ban or you're on that path or you have just uh, one meditation technique from Yogananda, if we tune into the techniques, the purpose of each technique that we learn is to help us draw the energy in. The energy is always flowing in and out. It's flowing up and then out through the senses. And each technique that we have, even the double breathing, tense and relax, tense and relax, the even count breathing, the hunk saw watching the breath, everything is about drawing energy in. If we know the energization exercises, it's about tuning in and becoming aware of not only how to direct, but how to redirect that energy. So we tense and as we relax and feel, we offer it back up and then moving through the OM technique and all of our preliminary Kriya and Kriya techniques. So if we are feeling a desire to sit, but the energy is pulling us out, if we can really tune into the techniques along the journey, wherever we are, whatever techniques we have, that's inherently going to help us draw the energy in, which will allow us to sit for longer and deeper meditations. And then the other aspect is everything that Mark and Pam and Sam are sharing, particularly when I heard that you are a farmer. It reminded me of, many of you may know Zach and Haley, Abby, who live up in Camino Island um, in Washington, and they're doing great work on the farm up there. And um, uh, they always speak about just being in the rhythm of nature and being in the rhythm of what it means to work on a farm and work with the land. And that means that when the days are longer, they're working longer and they're out in nature and they're tuning in, just as Mark is saying, you know, with the Gayatri mantra being out in nature, but listening into the mantras to help us re refine our um, vibration. Or as um, Pam was sharing, feeling that sense of expansion. That's one of the reasons we go into nature. The whole purpose of a meditation is to shrink the ego's hold on us. The ego always thinks it's in charge, but as we can draw the energy in and up, we weaken the ego's hold on our reality and we expand into that consciousness. That's one of the reasons nature is so automatically soothing because nature is inherently expansive. It has no ego. Whether you're standing at the coast of the ocean or at the uh, looking at tall, beautiful trees in a forest, you are inherently, automatically a part of something so much bigger than you. And there's no ego involved in it at all. It's pure prana that is flowing through because nature is alive in the most visceral way, but it's not, it has no sense of self-definitions. And so we become a part of that greater flow. So even being out in nature and tuning into that, that in essence is the point of meditation. So it's not that we give up our meditation practices. We always want to come back and sit in that inner communion, but allowing the rhythm of your life to also, that lifestyle that you have to also um, uh, dictate that or uh, encourage, I should say, to encourage that expansive flow as Pam and Sam and Mark are all sharing. So. I want to add one thing. It is approaching <clears throat> our witching hour where we have to switch from our friends in Texas to our family here in Ananda Monterey Bay. We're getting ready to do our first online festival of light with Naya Swami Maria. And uh, so you're all welcome to join in and, <laughs> and, and share in the experience. And I also wanted to advertise that on March 21st, which just happens to be our anniversary, um, Lakshmi will be joining us in, in Ananda Monterey Bay. So if you like what you heard today, come and join us. <laughs> come and join us at Ananda Monterey Bay on the 21st of March. And, and, uh, and join us all in again. I want to thank you, Lakshmi. I want to thank every, all of our friends, our dear friends at Ananda, Dallas, and Texas. You guys Didn't have been a, a great and wonderful inspiration for us. And we will see you Friday night for happy hour kirtan. So yeah. bring your voices and come and join. Bye. Blessings. Blessings thank to you, you all. So thank much. you, Sam. Thank you, Pam. So, I, oh, go ahead, Supriya. Well, I just wanted to chime in and bring it back to what everybody's been saying, especially about being outdoors. Um, one thing I like to play with, to play with Divine Mother or Mother Nature, is um, you've probably heard this um, to ask Divine Mother to allow me when I'm outside so that I can stay in an attitude of meditation. I'm not sitting meditating, 
but maybe I'm working in the garden or sweeping the patio. <coughs> I ask her to give me divine eyes that I may see whatever I am doing with her eyes. And that's been amazing, like to see the little pebbles, like the squirrel, right? We don't always see these little tiny little things. But if I'm sweeping and then I go to pick up what I've swept, sometimes the blades of grass or the weeds maybe that have gotten on my patio or the bird seeds that have blown onto my patio from the feeder, I notice these things and because when I can do it with divine eyes, I just have so much more appreciation for what I am seeing because I'm trying to see with divinity. And just recently we had the topic, can man see God? You know, and, and basically taking it back to when we see with divine eyes, we do see God, whether it's in the mud, um, in, in the snow, which is easy because it's pretty, but the mud may not look pretty, but when we see it and then we see the earthworm, oh, there's an earthworm, look what it's doing. You know, that's to me has been a big help when I'm outside, not sitting in meditation, but to have the attitude of divine eyes. And then I see very differently. I've always kind of imagined, you know, the, the famous story about uh, Yogananda after he got his, his first experience of cosmic consciousness from uh, Sri Yukteswar. And then, you know, Sri, he comes down out of it and, and Sri Yukteswar says, okay, now let's go sweep the balcony. <laughs> and I always think, boy, that must have been an amazing balcony sweeping that was going on, you know, <laughs> being in, in such a higher state of consciousness. Um, and I think the, the few times that I've touch that it is like that it's like everything becomes extraordinary all right so did somebody else have want to pipe eric yay, eric, yay. hi eric hey you know i was thinking my my favorite probably my favorite saying or one of my favorite sayings is the one you gave of mother Teresa, yeah. which is doing small things with great love and you know it's i think of um even something as simple as and the difference between dead soil and live soil is one thing. If you have, there, we're creating all over America and the world dead soil. It's, you put enough stuff on it and it kills all the microorganisms within a piece of soil. And that's what gives life to soil. You can't grow anything in dead soil without all like trillions and billions of these microorganisms going throughout that soil. And they can create it now. You have a certain things that it's not like you have to dig up the soil. You just have to imbue it with things. You have to stop putting bad things on it and just doing whatever makes the two trillion or billion or whatever those microorganisms grow into the soil. And I always consider that, like I sometimes I would be asked to speak at a nod to Dallas, and I thought, oh, that's nice, you know, and, and I would speak at it. I thought, anybody can speak, but it's what you do when you walk out the door each time every person is a minister of some kind and it's like vibrating into the soil of people it's not what you say it's it is that field that you carry and whether it's you're doing an inner mantra or you're in nature and, and you're looking at other people and seeing how you consider them and how you walk by them and you i think it's a lot subtler than we know and it's no person ever does anything alone. They say it to people and it, it just goes out in our vibration. So I appreciate that emphasis on the very smallest and subtlest of things, including us all getting together, which is my way of staying connected. It's my little practice each week. I appreciate so much. It's so powerful what you're saying, Eric. Um, and it's, it is the essence of 
I mean, I hate to use the word Ananda success because success is such a worldly term, but it's the essence of what allows Ananda to have the power that it does. Every single individual at Ananda is here for self-realization and they're bringing everything they have to every moment of their spiritual life, whether it's again in the temple or out in the world. And that power, you know, that individual devotion has a magnetism that creates massive change. And just like you're saying, if there's a concert going on and you're an audience member, you're just as important. It, you're, you are a contributor to that energy because we are beings who understand and relate to one another energetically. So whether you're up there singing a solo, conducting, or you're in the audience, your effort and energy is felt. It's beautiful what you're saying. And thank you, you know, I'm teaching, a, a, we have a retreat later this afternoon and I'm sharing parables of the Bible and I was talking about all the parables that Christ shares about the soil and the seeds and what you were just speaking about, it just came to my mind that it's perfect. I, so I might give you a nod this afternoon in my retreat class and talk about all of what you're saying about the billions of microorganisms and that soil is never dead, that it's always alive if we can imbue it in the right way. So thank you. 